Hello, everyone. This is Professor Hamamoto. It is November 24th, year 2022, and it is 3 p.m. Pacific Daylight Time. Welcome one, welcome all on this wonderful Thanksgiving Day. We have a lot to be thankful for here in the United States of America. And I would like to dedicate this holiday vidcast to the late Aaron Swartz, because today's theme is the generational turnover of some of the old uh, punditocracy, if you could call it that, the pundits, people like Glenn Beck, who was 58 years old. You're not going to get 30-year-olds, 20-year-olds watching that type of show because people operate on the basis of cohorts. So they're bringing in, they meaning the same forces that uh, supposedly Glenn Beck is opposing, are bringing in new faces, younger faces, which is always, it's welcome, you know. Personally, my, my career, my academic career, it's, it's over, you know, it's gone. <laughs> um, I've, I've made my contribution. Hopefully my general contributions are not done, but um, so I'm not resentful of that at all. I welcome it. And that's why I dedicate this vidcast to um, Aaron Swartz, who, if you don't remember, is the person who was uh, sacrificed to the altar of the new technocracy because he was one of the young people who grew up, the new generation that grew up with the internet. Geezers like me, that's something that we had to learn. We had to acquire it. I'm, I'm a product of the television generation. It's pretty obvious, right? And, um, you know, the, the record business and, and that particular popular culture. And uh, he was sacrificed at the tender age of 26 26 years of age, um, brilliant, brilliant young man. And also I'd like to pay tribute to his parents who did such a wonderful job of raising such a wonderful, thoughtful, active, obviously super intelligent, we, we know that, but a committed individual, committed American who wanted the best for his fellow Americans and for, by extension, for the people of the world. And um, let's include all parents, right? My parents, for example. And I mean, it's through our parents that we learned a uh, what justice is, right? What's right, what's wrong. Very, very simple lessons in morality. I don't think human beings are necessarily <laughs> born with some sort of innate on what we should do and what we shouldn't be doing. And uh, it takes um, uh, adult experience influence to um, to really teach us um, the difference between right and wrong. And then we have, of course, institutions that uh, traditionally have, have done that job as well. They've, they've been failing miserably. One of the reasons why I think that um, Aaron Swartz was such a phenomenon is that I don't think he got a lot of um, public education, uh, public schooling type education. He was a grad student at Harvard. I think he also was a doctoral student at MIT, you know, two of the top in the world schools for his area, computing science. And I think it was too slow for him. So he quit both areas. But anyway, if you want to see a good documentary, because I don't, this talk's going to be about what Whitney Webb represents. But if you want to see a good documentary, I recommend The Internet's Own Boy. 2014. Excellent documentary. And then there's this book of his own writings, Aaron Swartz, that's published by uh, the New Press. It's a few years old. It's the boy who could change the world. And there's articles written by him when he was like 19 years old. Okay. And remember, he he committed suicide. I think that's a true story. I don't think he was, he was uh, suicided. But uh, he was put in a situation where he was almost forced to commit suicide. That's the way I, I think the people who persecuted him are, are his are responsible for his death. Um, anyway, I, I want to remember his, his legacy because a new person, a synthetic youth hero is being put forth to us, right? For this generational cohort, right? Because like I said, that's, Basic marketing, like we only identify, um, not only, but we identify most passionately with people who are like us, 
either professionally in gender lines, you know, if you're queer, you're going to identify with queer characters on the, um, well, you name your show, they're, they're there, right? Um, oh, by the way, I think our long national light, uh, nightmare of a GLBTQ hegemony has finally come to an end because dancing with especially the transgenderism um, I, uh, agenda part, right? Gay rights, gay liberation was hijacked and it got turned into transgenderism. Now it's moving into the trans uh, human phase, right? But our long national nightmare um, known as transgenderism is coming to an end because the last episode of Dancing with the Stars ended. I think it started in 2007, something. So you have a whole generation of young people who thinks uh, gen transgenderism is glamorous. And it was a Disney produced show, I believe. It's, again, another example of positive change. A lot to be thankful in America and in the world is that uh, the Disney company, the parent company's ABC, um, is is hurting. It's, they're hurting so bad that they had to rehire the guy that re, you know, Robert Iger, who resigned as the CEO only eleven months ago, because the stock value is plummeting. Because you and me, right, Mister Nor, Mister and Mrs. Normie <laughs> of America, we're done with the whole pedo culture. We're done. We were never on board to begin with, but once. We had independent journalists start pointing out the obvious. Uh, Balenciaga, by the way, the, the designer of Haute Couture, right? They got busted because people now have the eyes to see and the ears to hear of the psyops that's going on here, right? And it's really no thanks to Whitney Webb because my main complaint about this book, which, by the way, I encourage everybody who's a newbie, read this book. It's a good primer. Yes, it's pronounced primer, not primer. Primer for people who are just realizing that there's something going on, but you don't know what it is. Do you, Mr. Jones? That's Dylan, by the way. Uh, I might got a word or two off there. But if you're a newbie, which I, it's hard for me to believe anybody's just now kind of getting in. If you were around when the Kennedy assassination took place, you should you should know better by now. But if um, you're a youngster or, or 20 something, 30 something like her, who um, let's say you're fresh out of college and you were majoring in political science or worse yet, um, comparative literature, and you listen to your professor at Yale University who has some sort of endowed chair and blah, 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 and teaching you all about love and GLBTQ and gender fluidity. Uh, you do need some remedial work. And this is a good um, uh, resource for you. I don't mean to say this condescendingly. I, I, my position is, however you can enter into this, you know, so be it. That's great. You know, myself, I read all kinds of material as I was educating myself into this world about, um, I think it was in uh, high school when uh, my mother gave me a condensed version of the multi-volume Warren report, because we were both into the assassination. By the way, speaking of seminal moments, when I was in grad school, and you really don't know, you know nothing when you're in grad school. You think you do, or you want to, but you don't. I'm saying this because the most obnoxious people in the world are doctoral students, right, grad students, those are the people who are on the front lines doing all the direction of, of Antifa and BLM and these other synthetic groups, probably run by intelligence agency. And I broached that possibility with uh, Jeremy Kuzmarov on my Tuesday show. And he said, yeah, it's quite possible. that it's some, something like a, a more recent uh, manifestation of what we saw in Jonestown back in 1978. Maybe they're going to go into a mass uh, uh, suicide. Now, don't, don't don't gloat over that, but I'm saying, you know, that's usually how they get rid of useful idiots after they've, they've um, outlived their usefulness. And my argument where I'm going is that, that there is going to be a purge of people in the the existing uh, oligarchy of the Democratic Party and Republican Party, and I'm not—I won't be surprised if it manifests itself 
in attacks in private residencies, like what happened to Mr. Paul Pelosi, or even large-scale tragedies similar to Jonestown. So we can learn from history. There are certain patterns, call them playbooks, if you will, that recur, but you have to be a student of history in order to recognize them. And that's really my métier. That's my my superpower, to put it in Marvel cartoon language. Uh, Marvel movies are primarily Israeli uh, psyop, you know, my gosh, you got an Israeli who's Wonder Woman? My God, Gal Gadot, and she's beautiful, yeah, but she's not even American. But that's that's part of the latter stage of empires. You have foreign governments who take over all the, the cultural, economic, um, and military institutions. It gets hollowed out. The vacuum, the theft becomes so extreme that we're, we're ripe. Uh, America is right for the pickings from, from, and it's not just the Chai Coms, all right? So a seminal moment for me is when I found out just at the last moment, there was no e email back. This is like the Stone Age. There was no email. I just heard it through word of mouth. I was in grad school, stupid, ignorant grad student, studying comparative culture at the University of California, Irvine, right? And I heard that one of the, uh, the, uh, lecturers. His name's uh, John Jurassi. I don't know if he's still around, but his claim to fame was that um, he was finishing up his PhD in the London School of Economics, right? You know, about the Fabians and all that. He's a leftist socialist um, friend of, uh, I think it was brought in by a guy named uh, Stanley Aronowitz, really well-known left. I studied with, with people like on that level, right? Uh, these, these are like new left type people who started getting to academia and eventually were able to take it over. And they were um, people like, um, you know, Bill Ayers of that generation. Okay, I studied with people of that ilk. And then later they were able to workshop synthetic political characters such as uh, Barack Hussein Obama and how to use race and critical race theory and gay and, and lesbian identity issues in order to leverage that into the uh, ideological takeover as well as the political economic takeover of uh, alien forces. Right? I don't mean UFO, maybe so, but I'm talking about foreign nationals of every stripe, every stripe. And of course, you know, the British, of course, that goes without saying. But gosh, even China has grown up, grown to the to the extent where where um, the United States has, has become um, easy pickings. And when I mention China, I should also don't don't absolve Taiwan of this here. It's not bad China, good Taiwan. We so I have to stop thinking in this little simplistic opposite. Taiwan intelligence is very, very powerful. And it might even be more destructive than the so-called chakams. And I suspect that a lot of these uh, people who are dumping on China, not that they don't deserve being criticized and held to account like any other nation in the global system, but I suspect a lot of them are on the uh, uh, Taiwanese uh, railroad, uh, payroll, right? Not Guomindang, because that kind of fell out of favor because all the literature and research came out about how the OS has CIA and has always been supplying the the Guomindang, the, uh, the the juice, the 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 resources, the, the 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 jets, the fighters, in order to prolong this um, synthetic um, Cold War in East Asia. So today, I didn't mean to talk about that so much. Today, we're going to celebrate. The decline of pedo culture, Disney stocks going down. They had to rehire um, uh, Iger, um, Robert Iger, and uh, Baphomet worship, which is attendant with the whole Disney culture. You know, Baphomet, the both male and female elements, the horned creature that children are supposed to uh, worship, right, at, at a young age. Uh, that's being exposed. There was a, a recent uh, exposure, as I alluded to of the uh, Haute Couture, Couturier Balenciaga. I'm sure he's long dead. I don't know who runs it now. It's probably some sort of MI6 uh, uh, operation there. And, and by the way, your boy here, Professor Amamoto, has been talking about for the last two years, people like Tina Brown and Anna Nuclear Wintour, right, of the Condé Nast publications, the British assets who run the, um, the high fashion and consumer business for American women and um, and uh, a significant part of the gay population who were beneficiaries 
of uh, of gay worship, right? And gay worship is over now, right? We're, we're, uh, America has ha had has had its full, not because of homophobia. It's just boring, and that's why uh, while I'm at it, that's why uh, Milo Yiannopoulos has to be sent home. All right. So, oh, Milo, we like him. He's so funny. He's so cute. He's so flamey gay. Well, that act is over, and uh, and there's a practical reason for getting him out of the way. He has now attached himself like a barnacle to, um, is it Marjorie Taylor Green, MTG? He's volunteered. He said he's, he's, he's an intern with her, but he's a fucking foreign national. He's British. Nothing against the British people, but how many times do I have to tell you that you got to look out for the five eyes and the traditional enemy of the United States of America? And they're still strong loyalists. There's two rails. The battle in the United States of America, 2022, is between the royalists, the vestigial but powerful royalists, the monarchists, and the republicans. And I mean that small r, not big r. The, the big r republicans can go to hell. They can join their, their big D democratic buddies in Hades. I'm talking about people who who are pro-American Republic, right? Like going back to the 19th century, Edgar Allan Poe, Herman Melville, they were already seeing the seeds, the conspiratorial seeds of self-destruction, of auto-destruction. Remember that short story that we all read in junior high school, but we hated it because the language was slightly archaic <laughs> or just say archaic all right because there's no such thing as slightly archaic for all you english majors out there who want to who want to uh, make sure that hop sing speaky papa english okay um remember that story yeah the cask of uh, uh montilado right yeah it's about freemasonry <laughs> and there's tons and tons Conan Doyle, all that great literature that turns out now that we that I personally have the eyes to see in the ears to hear and the added uh, information gathered over the years, I can see, wow, the teachers were really sending us a message in the bottle that were going to really benefit us. So we can, we can still return to these earlier pages in history. Mark Lane, let me finish up the story very quickly. Uh, the, the word got out that Mark Lane was going to show us the Zapruder film, right? This was not available at the time. He even... Um, brought in the 16 millimeter projector. I hope I don't have to explain what that is. This is before, even before VHS, right? But he had a, a 16 millimeter and he, and he showed the loop of the assassination by uh, Abraham Zapruder. Um, and yes, I know that there's some questions about who Abraham Zapruder really was. But the point is, is that I happen to have my, this is the first edition, by the way, of A Rush to Judgment. And I also, it's also, I also brought it up because he was the attorney for Jonestown. And, and uh, we did a show on Tuesday about the jo Jonestown Massacre. Or as we say in the Ozarks, Massacre. Sometimes I use that because I want to keep the dialects alive. Okay? Massacre. And I, I say that because it really irritates people when I say, yeah, the Boston Massacre or whatever it is. But yeah, that's Ozark lingo. It's all it also makes it more difficult for AI, right? Because they're they're kind of geared right now to um CNN uh standard neutral uh, American dialect. So I like to throw in just to confuse the algorithms, uh even though they don't have sentience at this point. I like to throw in some, you know, because I do have the ghetto past since I grew up in the in the ghetto. I you know I'd like to throw in some, you know Chop it up like they show on those sh those uh, those little radio programs that are directed specifically to young black people, right? That's all part of the psyops too. Right? I don't care if it's Ice Cube or whoever else who's bragging about the big, you know, the big deal. You know, let's get together like the weather. Yeah, let's get paid. You know, there's streaming going on, and at least Ice Cube had the had the intelligence. Say, well, no man, Ice, you know, streaming is also Hollywood. There ain't no way out of it. So anyway, let's trick the uh, algorithm and let's move into it. Now, you notice that in my um, description, my brief description here, I put Whitney Webb in uh, quotation marks because nobody knows who she really is. Well, there are some truly investigative reporters who do know. They just haven't gone public with 
with that yet. And that could be your assignment if this is what you you do for uh, avocation or professionally. Um, dig in, find out where what she's really about. Um, the, you know, I'm not going to rehearse what I've found except for one significant fact that, that that had me doing a double take. Okay, can you dig how what her net worth is? I'm talking about quote unquote Whitney Webb, her or him. I don't know. I might think it might be a dude for all I know. Right. Because we know that's part of the psyops is uh, and that's that was what Dancing with the Stars was all about, slipping in the whole gender fluidity and make it cool for even even the older generation, you know, sort of a trans generational family fun built around trans um, sexualism. Right. And transgenderism. But uh, dig it. This is from factsbuddy.com. If you want to fact check me, and I'm just going what they're telling me. It could be wrong. I don't know. But even if it's wrong by a million or two dollars, it's still pretty impressive. But Whitney Webb, whoever that is, is uh, her or his estimated net worth is $9,800,000. Yes, you heard it. When I first read it, I thought it said $9,800 because that was probably much more than my net worth was at 30. That's probably more than my net worth today. But for a 33 year old, I thought 9,800. That sounds about right, especially if you're a starving journalist. Journalism doesn't pay. It doesn't even pay for people who come right out of uh, uh, the Newhouse School up in Syracuse or Columbia Journalism or all these really decrepit journalism schools who are staffed by new leftists who are clueless, except for some uh, neo-Marxist 60s uh, sloganeering and memories of the radical 1960s. That's, that's all they have to contribute to the world of journalism these days, right? Uh, fortunately, she didn't go to J school, but she's still worth uh, nine. Let's round it out. Well, I'll give her the benefit. Let's say nine million dollars, U.S. dollars. Right. So where did that money come from? Didn't come from writing them articles for Mint Press. And I'll let you do your work on that. Kind of another fishy organization, but that's no um, that's no reason to condemn her because most of them are fishy and most of them come from uh, from people who have an agenda to fund, a political economic agenda to fund, right? Owning a newspaper or a publication online these days or a media outlet, that's a license to print money. That's not my uh, aphorism. That's some journalist from from years past. So that's your, you know, and all I have is tube you. Uh, which is fine. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm perfectly uh, happy with that. I reach more people in one single vidcast than I do in uh, one or two years of teaching. Um, there's advantages to both, but anyway, I'm not complaining. So um, let's take a look at who we're talking about here. Most people know, know who Glenn Beck is. That's not the problem. The problem is, and this really, again, it took me aback, He's an accomplished professional, right? Regardless of what you think about him or I think about him, his operation is really slick. It's sharp. It's professional, the blaze, and it's marginally better than a CNN or even Fox News, where he began his national exposure in Fox News. I think it was just like, hey, we're going to we're going to bud you off here and, and give you your own gig here at the blaze. And certainly he couldn't capitalize that himself. Who's behind Glenn Beck? All right. We have to ask all these questions as we're being, oh, wow, she's a 33-year-old wonderkind with two chillins, right, who wrote two volumes of this book. They're almost a total of 1,000 pages, volume one and volume two. Um, so to hear a Glenn Beck gush over a newbie and check out one of the uh, talks I gave a few, I don't know, maybe two or three months, maybe a couple months, can't remember. It's on my playlist, but it's specifically about what I call pop-up pundits. Put that into the lexicon, right? Ali Alexander, the dark-skinned black guy who can't decide if he's an Arab one day or, or uh, African-American another day, he is not the king meme master. I am the meme master. Pop up punditry. 
right? He's the guy that's going to stop the steal. Is the steal um, going to stop? No. Right. So let's take a look at uh, Mr. Glenn Beck fawning over this new phenomenon who, I don't mean to prejudice you, but I can't help myself, who is a synthetic creation. You got the, That's one of the reasons why I, I played Hurry Up, Two Minute Warning. And as soon as I started seeing her face all over the place, because I, I got tipped off to her three years ago, at least, this Whitney Webb down in Florida with, with Mint Press. Right, but when when I saw her blowing up, blowing up on my own publisher, trying day nonetheless. And this is no knock on um, uh, Chris Milligan, the editor in chief. Uh, but I'm, as he told me himself, I'm the only author that ever drove up to Walterville, Oregon. This is outside of Eugene, not far from the University of Oregon. Beautiful country. But I drove all the way from Sacramento up to Walterville to meet him at his office. <laughs> no authors ever come here. <laughs> and I'm sure Whitney Webb has. And I'm just telling you this is because one of the big difference but between this type of journalism, I call them desk jockey journalism, right? They're at the desk and they're the mouseketeers. They, they manipulate mouse, my, mice or mouses. Oh, by the way, here's my trying day book. I'm sure she ripped off a lot of it. That's okay. This is a book. This book's already expired. This stuff has material in it. It's like that's uh, the published books are like 20 years old. And this historical scenario she talks about is like 60, 70, sometimes 80 years old, right? She's kind of like um, the Annie Jacobson of the millennial set, right? Because again, cohort marketing pioneered at the Chicago School of Advertising, not not New York, not the usual, you know, people down at um, you know uh, the agency of uh, Mr. Propaganda, Sigmund Freud, right, Bernays, right. There's a whole Chicago school that got the Midwestern down home, less aggressive, less obtrusive type of marketing uh, that she. Uh, managed to, you know, exploit. But here's Servers of Empire, because she does at least talk about the whole all-important Asia and Asian-American connection to the New World Order. And this book is going to grow. It, it was published way back in 2014. This book is going to grow, and its importance is only, gra and that was my intention, by the way, it's only gradually going to seep into the intelligentsia and to the general consensus the only person in general who, who, who really understood its implications, deeper implications, is my friend and colleague, John O'Loughlin. All right. But you know, he was the first. And if you've been watching his show, by the way, for the last four years, you're going to be bored to tears by reading this because he's covered it all. Right. Everybody who does this type of work has gone through the canon of literature that a 33 year old pick and choose. She did a splice and you know, it's not plagiarism, you know, verbatim, but it is a cut and paste job. Uh, you don't have to do that. I mean, you can read stuff into a uh, uh, audio software and then you can rejigger it and do it. A guy named Sean Atwill, uh, who does these true crime books. He has a really popular site, too. I like him, by the way. But all those books are, are just rehashes of what's already out there. And that does not meet, meet the uh, criterion of scholarship from my world. It doesn't. It meets the. It does meet the criterion of plagiarism, though. But the reason I'm bringing this up, I thought it was obvious to most people, but it's not. That's why I have to tell you that this this particular talk is not about Whitney Webb, whoever she is. This particular uh, talk is dedicated to the central importance of a discernment in doing this type of work, because every time one of these characters enters the historical stage, right? We won't be whipsawed by them intellectually or emotionally because that's what's going to happen. People go, oh, Whitney Webb, Whitney Webb, Whitney Webb, you know, Whitney Houston, Britney Spears, Madonna, right? Jennifer Love Hewitt, whoever else. And then you have that bonding experience. You got that, that imprinting of the little duckling to the mother hand, right? And you can't break it. Right. So they're going to carry Whitney Webb for like, she'll probably have a, like a 30 year career like Glenn Beck. And my prediction for 2023 is that Glenn Beck, after reviewing the tape of the show, Glenn Beck is and his people, whoever they are, 
right? Got to find out who the money people are behind Glenn Beck. And Glenn Beck was set down to Austin, Texas, is to be the kinder, friendlier version of Alex Jones because the long-term plan was to move him out eventually, maybe through some kind of fake, you know, criminal, you know, court trials and uh, make it look like he bankrupted him, you know, and he's going to go out as a hero. And then they'll, then you got Glenn Beck already there, right? And then you've got the new cohort, your uh, Dr. Sebastian Gorka, the guy from uh, <coughs> Europe who is a newly minted American. I'm a fourth generation American. You know, this guy comes from uh, from Britain, right? And uh, can slide right in because they can't give a yellow man a break. You know, I feel you, yay. I feel you. I feel you, bro. I grew up in the hood myself, okay? I told you I got a ghetto pass because, you know, I'm one of them Orientals who got stuck behind the colored line with y'all, you know, the, the browns and the blacks too. But there was the yellows. Let's not forget that. Right? Your mama and your grandparents will know there were always a, Orientals living amongst the black people in, in, in America, in the United States, especially in the larger cities, whether it's Chicago, Los Angeles, for sure, San Francisco. We was living with you. All right. So I, I, I understand, um, you know, what you're about. Uh, the younger black people will, will not. They'll probably see me as the enemy, right, because they, they grew up under a different culture. Right, hate, hate the Chinamen, beat them up, right? Attack them on the subway. Uh, these people are taken with, from what our, you know, first it was the Koreans back in the 80s. We got to get rid of them. So, anyway, I'm tired of the interracial warfare here. Uh, let's get to the real uh, sources of this type of conflict. And she's contributing to it in her own way in, in the guise of uh, trying to illuminate for us. Uh, the real problems that we, most of us of our generation know about, and we've lived it. Just like I met Mark Lane, just like I had lunch at his invitation, him and his wonderful wife, to the private residence of one Gordon Thomas in his beautiful countryside home in Bath, England, right? One of my heroes, authors of heroes. He's the guy that wrote the first and definitive book on Robert Maxwell. It was not Whitney Webb. She talks a, a lot about him. And if you want to really know about the true Maxwell story, then you have to check out someone who's with us right now. Right. And she's very active. Her name is Kirby Summers. And I'm not just dropping her name because she's been on this show a couple of times, two or three times. And, you know, I don't think it's a conflict of interest. I, my publisher's trying day, her publisher's trying day, but it's a coincidence. We, I didn't know this book was coming out, right? So I'm, I don't have a conflict of interest there, but if you want to find out the true story of Ghislaine Maxwell and Epstein, the, the advanced story, not, not the training wheels version, but the ongoing story, then you got to check her sub stack out. Yeah. I don't know much about the technology of it, but it's, in a nutshell, it's kind of like a replacement for Twitter. I think, you know, I don't have to go into Elon Musk. And it looks like it's a pretty good alternative. So I've been following her articles. And and, and the point is, all right, is that there are a lot now more alternative. I forgot the guy's name. I think his name's Lee something. His, his last name is Lee. But he covers the Southern District of New York every day. And he also was just um, covering daily. Now, that was his beat as a journalist. Right. He's not a desk jock. He's out there. He was covering the United Nations and I've been buying his books. In fact, I reached out to him. I sent him an email. I said, I'd like to have you on the show and, and like talk about your background and what you're doing and how you're being received. I forgot his first. I, I had his books here. I was going to show them. But if I can get him on, on this show, I'll let him speak for himself. But the point is, is that. Uh. Don't let the publishing business or Glenn Beck types decide for you and for me who is credible, who's who's up, who's down, who's cool, who's uh, who's whack, you know, whatever it is. Decide for yourself. And uh, I trust that you'll come to the right conclusion. So here's Glenn Beck fawning over. And, okay, I forgot my prediction. She's going to get her own show. She's going to she's going to have that. 30 something cohort, the Glenn Beck, who looks like, you know, granddaddy, which he might be. They don't want to look at geezers like me, you know, or, or Glenn Beck. He's, he's younger than me, but he's still, you know, a geezer to someone in their 30s. 
Um, but he's he's paving the way for her to get her own show. She's blowing up, and baby, she's gonna her net worth is gonna grow much larger than nine point eight million dollars. Maybe I should ask her for a job as a gag writer, you know, just to kind of loosen her up, loosen her a little bit uptight, you know, she or he, whatever it is. And I think part of the strain comes from the fact that she's really struggling to keep her voice in a lower register, like Elizabeth Holmes. Remember of Theranos, right? The scam artist who presented, oh, we were scammed. No, they weren't scammed. You know, including David Boyce, who also represented, you know, he was a big investor there. All the all the big shots had their money in Theranos. It was a bust out scheme. Um, she, she was left holding the bag, but I'm not going to feel sorry for her. But yeah, I'll, I'll show you what I mean in a moment about, about the lower invoice, because I'm talking about perpetration here. Perpetrators, synthetics. Right. It wasn't only uh, Joan Rivers that, that kept getting plastic surgery. You know, <laughs> we have people who have reconstructed everything parading in front of us, like in shows like Dancing with the Stars. Here's Glenn Beck. At least he hasn't gone under the knife yet, but he's been given his orders on who he needs to promote to lay down the red carpet for the new talent. I think this is the most important hour I have ever been a part of in broadcast. I've done this for 45 years. This is the most important person and hour you can you Well, you got the idea. I guess uh, Blaze Media uh, cut that off for the the his uh, sonorous tenor voice uh, triggered the algorithm to cut it off. But you get the idea. He does this in more than, um, I'm going to remove that from the studio. Maybe it's a memory issue because I put a lot of stuff out there. Um, yeah, I'm going to clean this up a little bit since I'm running a little bit long anyway. Okay, let's talk a little bit about because there's a lot of word magic here. There's sort of... There's a vocal audio magic going on by the lowering of her, the register of her or his voice. Um, and there's, you know, we, we can pick up the facial tics if you watch it over. Remember I did a talk on Dr. Paul Ekman, who talked about the science of micro expressions. He has a whole consultancy about how to detect lies. Most of it's BS, of course, but it doesn't really matter if if the courts will run with it, then it's it's okay. It's just like the, the lie detector, right? Uh, Dr. Marston, the guy that created uh, Wonder Woman, right? He supposedly, uh, him and his girlfriend or wife, his um, polygamous wife, develop what's called a lie, lie detector, which is not suitable for evidence in most courts. <clears throat> but it doesn't matter if people believe it's it's true, It's then, then it is true. Um, but... So far as the word magic is concerned, what is the name of, and I've discussed this with a trusted um, friend and colleague about this. Uh, her podcast is called, guess what? Unlimited Hangout, right? We, by now, know the terminology, right? Conspiracy theory, we know where that came from, CIA, right? We've heard of the false flag. Right. We know about the limited hangout. So she, playing on that word play, word magic play, she riffs off of that and calls her operation, her broad, uh, podcast, Unlimited Hangout. Now, just think about it for a moment. That means that it's gone. It's, she is going beyond limited. It is unlimited. She's giving herself carte blanche, if I can mix metaphors here, for... Um, for her podcast, um, uh, disinformation. And of course, disinformation doesn't mean 100% lies. It could be 90% uh, sweetness and 10% poison, like rat poison, right? I'm not saying that's what she does, but, um, and I'm not even going to ding her on all the omissions and all the different uh, examples of, uh, I figured it was going to be 90% rehash material. Like you've seen a lot of indie journalism right now. Sean Otwell is one. Another guy is uh, Oli Damagard. His first book on the assassination of um, uh, UN Secretary General Dag Hammarskjöld. Excellent. 
But then he just started rehashing all the Kennedy assassination stuff. He's not even an American. I mean, anybody is entitled or is welcome to study the Kennedy assassination because it has global Im implications. But he had nothing uh, new to say. Uh, and he has nothing to say, but it's familiar. Maybe that's another another factor. It's familiar enough for us to to be to to digest it. It's palatable. In other words, damn, she's got a, a net worth of nine point eight million dollars. So she's got the unlimited hangout there. It comes from because I had a hard time finding where she you know where she went to school, but apparently she uh, went or attended Davidson College. Don't know much about it. It's probably based at liberal arts, probably based in a Christian denomination, maybe Protestantism. It's in uh, North Carolina, right? And the reason I mentioned it's religious based is because one of the big tells for me is, and and one of the one of the reasons why I think Glenn Beck is in on the ruse and is paving the way for her is try to answer certain questions that you and me, right? or you and I have about a Whitney Webb that just came out of the blue, right? A pop-up pundit. So he's going blah, 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 yip, 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 bow, wow, wow, woof, woof, talking about how astounding a person is. But every once in a while, he'll broach one of these questions. He'll address them to her that that pretends to answer the lingering doubts that that we might have about who this synthetic character is uh, by the name of uh, Whitney Webb. Let me give you one example here. Are you God-driven? You... Let's see if that play. Let's see if that plays again. That's okay. I got. I got enough out there. Okay, did you hear it? I got enough of that that excerpt there. It goes on for about you know less than sixty seconds anyway. He asks her seemingly out of blue, "Are you God driven?" And uh, even though she went to you know I think it's Baptist uh, Church affiliate. I'm not really sure Davidson College. I have to check that out. Even though she has, I think she majored in theology as well. Even though she has that background. And uh, she alludes very briefly to herself as being Christian. And I'm not criticizing her on the basis of being Christian or non-Christian or some you know, other re religion. That's not really the point here. But the, the most troubling part of it is that I think she's uh, one of those, you know, I, I gave a talk not long ago on uh, crypto Blavatskyanism or neo Blavatskyan, because that's not a good name. It doesn't have a really good look in uh, conservative circles or even left circles or progressive circles. It's kind of woo-woo for the leftists. And for us, we know about um, its connection to the Lucius trust and Luciferian thought and um, and uh, behavior and its link also to wealthy capitalists, American and British capitalists. And I'm sure there's wealthy British and American capitalists behind Glenn Beck that we don't buy. I'm sure there's wealthy Anglo-American and probably um, uh, Muslim or Arab uh, wealth behind um, Mint Press and, uh, by extension, Whitney Webb. Uh, probably a whole conglomerate of, of global illuminist uh, financiers and bankers that she presumes to critique and lay at the floor over the ones we already know about anyway. The Bushes, the Clintons. Do, you, do I need to add any more names? We've been there. We know that. All right, so Glenn Beck. Professor Glenn Beck, remember he was doing that shtick about three years ago? We'd have the uh, whiteboard all up there and he would dress up in his tweeds and 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 go through, expound from board to board about how the world really works. So he shouldn't be surprised about any of this material. Yet he is so astounded by the brilliance of this 33-year-old who came out of nowhere. But he asked, has to ask that question on our behalf. Are you god driven so rather than me playing the rest because it's not going to you know they got the algorithm dialed in here tube you does and they're not gonna let me play it go to that link uh let's see i'll give you the name of the show i think it's on uh, tube you it's called how elites will create a new class of slaves whitney webb the glenn beck 
podcast episode 162. I think it's still on there. You can watch it. And I encourage you. And wow, it's had, when I took this note down in, uh, but on the 19th of this month, it already had 1.6 million views. So that's why I had to stage this intervention really quick because she's picking up traction. She's more than picking up traction. She's the wheel now. <laughs> She's the wheel. No, we're just the mud stuck in the tread. At least that's the master plan, right? Whoever's handling Glenn Beck, baby, and uh, Whitney Webb. It's kind of an androgynous name, Whitney. Huh? That should be a uh, a uh, a tip off right there. Even though she professes to be a mother twice over, but that's that's not a that's not the main issue here. Okay, let's see here. Yeah, she's um she talks about it more than one. I I took uh, written notes as well in anticipation of not being able to run these clips here. But at uh, minute number thirty nine earlier, she this is like the second or third time she mentions it because at the initial initial stage, Glenn Beck asks her if she's not frightened for her own safety. She says, "No, I view this as an energetic struggle." It doesn't say God struggle. It didn't say it's biblical. And she went to Davidson College, and she says she's a Christian. She doesn't say it's you know I'm a, I'm a believer in Christ and He protects me. She says, "No, it's an energetic spiritual um, a level that we're dealing with. That's why I'm not afraid." And then in order to answer his, uh, Glenn Beck's question about, "Are you God driven?" She says, um, yes, but not in the way of God the Father, right? The great man in the sky. Uh, I deal it, deal with it on, on an energetic level. She uses that stock phrase. This is why I can tell it's, it's rehearsed. And that's also to placate her natural audience, her natural constituents, constituency, which would be Christians and those who are uh, of a conservative bent because the leftists don't care. It's the people who are going to be buying one nation under blackmail and then being imprinted by this wunderkin who, who are going to have this doubt. She is, I would say that she is not a believer. Uh, she's a new age Gaia Neo Blavatskian. And Glenn Beck kind of finesse, pulls rescues her from her stomach. She visibly, watch the clip on your own, she visibly shifts in her seat when she tries to answer the question, even though it's been rehearsed tons and tons of times through her handlers. Cause if you've seen her speak, she's like, um, she has like OCD level of uh, rain man. Remember the movie with Tom Cruise and uh, Dustin Hoffman. She's got rain man like res recitation, resis not resuscitation, res recitative prowess. Okay. It's like, sometimes you, you 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 know you're in church or temple or wherever and there's someone who can recite scripture from from memory right without missing a beat without any sort of pause right like glenn beck right his his biggest um asset is the fact he doesn't lead lead any dead air right that's a sin that's that's stu peters that's uh, um ben shapiro these are all the people who've had that dead air programmed out of their delivery uh, because unlike this show, which is entirely, almost entirely, I do prep, a lot of prep work, for, but it's spontaneous, that's scripted, spontaneous. These guys are completely scripted. So yeah, check that out. Check check the uh, that, that little uh, sort of doubt there. But you know, she's 33 years old. Um, you know, even Jesus Christ himself didn't re reappear on the scene until he was 30. Okay, so we can give maybe she's still trying to work it out. Um, <clears throat> some of us, you know, work it out for our entire lives. So I'm not going to ding her on that. But don't mistake her as, as being a uh, Christian uh, conservative. <clears throat> New age, yes, even though she's, you know, she's um, profoundly against, uh, at least by her account, transhumanism. You know, she knows the whole history. She's extracted it, she's synthesized it, and she's warmed it over for the consumption of her uh, demographic, her younger demographic. Um, let's see here. Let's take a look at um, going back. I'm, I'm not going to torment you with another uh, truncated Beck excerpt, but I will talk 
expound a little bit more on her the remaking of Whitney Webb. It's been a project. It's been a multi-year project coming out of nowhere and then all of a sudden being worth $9.8 million <laughs> and going on a platform maybe just one notch below that of Glenn Beck. He would insist on that, right, since he's doing his job for it. So here's here's uh, Elizabeth Holmes. I compared her, her to Elizabeth Holmes, right? Aaron Swartz died when he was 26, right? We're talking about that crucial imprinting generation, right? But we're not celebrating. We've forgotten about him already. Elizabeth Holmes came on the scene. She's, I just checked in preparation for this talk. As of today, she's 38 years old. She's only a few years old, eight, five years old, let's say, than uh, Whitney Webb. So that was her cohort there. That's why I view um, Whitney Webb as being sort of like the Elizabeth Holmes of the uh, conservative uh, youngsters that are coming, our younger generation, the millennials that are coming along. And here's the the extent to which uh, Elizabeth Holmes went in order to uh, massage her credibility. And I think Whitney Webb had to go through this training process as well. It was a stunning fall from grace. Elizabeth Holmes is the Stanford dropout who became a tech billionaire after claiming to revolutionize lab tests using a single drop of blood. Now, as she faces a criminal trial, people are asking what happened to her voice. Holmes now speaks with a deep, commanding delivery. But her former professor says she used to sound a lot different. We're learning more about Elizabeth Holmes, the one-time billionaires who That's spectacular... Okay, that's cutting off too. I don't think it's a conspiracy, ladies and gentlemen. I think I'm running out of uh, memory. I have to go back and remove a lot of these videos. So that's why it's uh, freezing up here. Um, let's see. Yeah, I have, I'm doing a little housekeeping here. But let me continue with, with, um, with uh, her ruse. Uh, she deliberately went through coaching According to this clip, it's not me. This and and there are others that that verify this. Uh, uh, she went through coaching, professional coaching, in order to lower her voice so that she could speak in a high male tenor range to enhance her credibility. At least that's the story. That, there's probably truth to that because she had a high sort of um, uh, Minnie Mouse voice. You know, I don't mean to disparage people who who speak in that tone, but it, but it was not something that would command authority. Uh, I also think she was doing that to, to escape um, vocal recognition technology as well. I mean, she, she was, you know, studying this at, at Stanford, right? And remember how I talked about my use of dialect and slipping this word in order to confuse the algorithm? I think she, this is part of her, of her strategy. Anyway, that's just speculation on my part. The point is that, that Whitney Webb, to me, from studying her clips and her uh, her writing, right? And there, she's not the only one, right? I mentioned Annie Jacobson, but people on our side, supposedly another person I talk about often is uh, Dave McGowan, who went through this whole supposedly expose of the uh, strange goings on in Laurel Canyon, right? And I, I, you know, I just cannot get enough uh, people to say, oh, you're wrong. He's the real deal. Yeah, the whole counterculture was a giant CIA psyops. Well, a lot of it was, but but a lot of it was organic as well. And there's a lot of tells in his work, which I've talked about earlier, so I won't rehearse it. So she's not the first one. And I'm telling you these backstories is because I can recognize uh, fakes a lot easier than, than most people. I have a sensitivity to words. I am supposedly a wordsmith, a word magic. I picked up on um, uh, Unlimited Hangout and other tales as well, including her her vacillation, her waffling about the God question with a capital G. Are you a person of God? Are you an atheist? Where are you coming from? You know, do you have any sort of um, uh, interest in in uh, in God truth? Not 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 recitative truth, right? We can all subscribe, even whatever ideological background, we can all accept this. But but the problem that we're having today in 2022 is the rejection 
the the grassroots and and that's seen in the um the most recent um Balenciaga haute couture uh blasphemies that have been exposed um, recently right but our biggest problem is people like this who are not of god right whitney webb and um if she wants to um dedicate some time in order to explaining her background in davidson college that would be welcome and this is not some sort of um uh quote unquote witch hunt on my part i just like to know how does a person who who went to a a bible-based i think it's a bible-based college and majored in theology abandoned god it was a loss of faith that happens right you know you have the author nikos kazanzakis the great greek author Right, the Last Temptation of Christ. That was his novel that the movie was based on. He also, incredibly, he had his book Zorba the Greek adapted to cinema. But his books were always about young men, Greek men, who were um, trying to grapple with faith, you know, with, with belief in 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 the post-war system, where you know you've got you know the memory of Dachau in uh, Hiroshima, you know, where, where, where are we, right? So is, is Whitney Webb helping, helping us to regain our faith? Or is she just paralyzing us with fear? Because if I was a newbie reading volume one of One Nation Under Blackmail, if I was 33 years old, I was reading this, wow, 33, isn't that a Masonic number? <laughs> oh my gosh, Pro probably pure coincidence. Just like as I discover this original discovery with your boy, Professor Hamamoto, who does not have a net worth of $9.8 million. I think my net worth is probably uh, uh, 98 cents. Um, you know, Rose Parade, Pasadena Rose, Pasadena Rose, the Crucian Parade. Yeah, I've been doing some research today on it. My, my, my conjecture is coming to its barren fruition. And baby... For New Year's, I'm going to be doing a presentation on the Tournament of Roses, baby. The Tournament of Rosicrucian in Pasadena, California, IA, the Golden State. Why, for example, is it even called a tournament? Well, I looked in my Oxford Etymological Dictionary, and I looked under tournament, and it says, you know, a, uh, a jousting match dating back to medieval times, exactly of the origin, the point of origins of the Knights Templar. Okay, so if we understand, and this is something about, and the reason I'm mentioning this is because um, that, that approach is utterly absent in the, the historiography, let's call it. I won't even glor glorify it by, by, by elevating it to historic because it's mostly cut and paste. It's part of her methodology. It's it, it, it's absent the cult. If you're not writing cultural history, it might not not even writing political history with one eye, at least one eye on the occult, on the metaphysical substrate that that underlies the American Republic and the global ruling class, you're out to lunch, baby. You never find nothing, and she doesn't allude to it at all. And that's why I'm making such a big deal of the fact that she's always kind of skirting around the questions of, are you God driven? All right. There's some other evasions there, but I think that's the most important one because that really informs the uh, rest of her, um, her, uh, her analyses, if you want to call it that, even though I find myself agreeing with her on, on, on a fact by fact, point by point basis, almost all the time. She says, for example, Klaus Schwab is a distraction. He is, right? You know, I complained about, you complain about that. We don't need to talk about Klaus. We know he is a clown in a three ring circus. You know, the real issue is who owns the circus? Is it P.T. Barnum who said that there's a sucker born every minute? All right. She's good on uh, transhumanism. She's got a recitation going on. It's not scholarship, it's recitation. All right. And uh, she name checks Catherine Austin Fitz, you know, sound source and Mark Skidmore. They, they figure it out forensically, right, from a bookkeeping standpoint. 
the exact amount of money that was absconded with out of the public treasury, ostensibly, it's really private, privately held. So she's saying all these points are accurate. And that's where the rat poison analogy comes true. You only have to have a small percentage of the rat poison to, to kill the rodents. The rest of it can be be sweet, you know, bait, right? Palatable. Anyway, that's my uh, warning. Let me see what else I have before I sign off and before I wish you a uh, Thanksgiving. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Please check out that clip or it's the entire show by uh, Glenn Beck. And you will see definitively that he is uh, first and foremost a salesman. All right. He can sell anything. I'm not just talking about supplements or water purifiers or pillows or precious metals. He does that. You know, it's part of his show. It's part of the format. And he's a very, very convincing pitch man. But a pitch man can, uh, who's really good can sell anything, including ideas. And for our purposes, newbies like one, quote unquote, Whitney Webb. All right, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. That's my time. I'm going to wish you a happy Thanksgiving. I'm going to take a short walk, sit my down in front of my my turkey TV dinner. And uh, at 5 o'clock Pacific Daylight, uh, Daylight Time or 8 p.m. Eastern, I'm going to watch my friend and colleague, John O'Loughlin, play some live music for us, right? He said he's going to do it. So I'm just telling you, tune in, take a break for an hour, tune in back on his channel, Macduff Lives 2, and uh, watch the magic. He's going to make you very, very happy. I know it's, it's, a, it's a treat whenever he plays. All right, ladies and gentlemen, again, happy Thanksgiving. Uh, my deepest respect and thanks to all the wonderful parents out there who have uh, uh, raised uh, generations of wonderful uh, human beings. And uh, we will prevail because uh, most people, not just in the United States, but global globally, do believe in God. We are not Gaia worshipers or Nia Blavatskians. I'm not saying she necessarily is, but if she was a person of God, she would uh, claim it and acknowledge it with all her heart and soul instead of weaseling out of it with the assistance of the super salesman Glenn Beck. He says, oh yeah, it's just like George Lucas, you know, the force, let the force be with. No, no, it's not like George Lucas. And it's just the opposite. All right. Anyway, I want to end on a happy note and uh, enjoy your uh, holiday. And we'll see you, God willing. We'll see you in the live chat in an hour with uh, John O'Loughlin. But I'll see you on my show back, you know, coming this coming Tuesday. All right. Thank you very much. Bye. Thank you for being with me. I really appreciate the support. Thank you. Bye.